My name is Peter Pilgrim. I'm going to be talking about uh, Scala, JavaFX, Java EE7, and enterprise integration, and what we are here to do. What can we do about it? So, I, my name is Peter Pilgrim, and I am a Java champion. I am an independent contractor, and I work normally with investment banks in the city of London, in the UK. Yeah, and I've been developing Java since 1998, and 1998, 1990, 1990, yes, 1998. And yeah, I'm a former jug leader as well. Scala, so Scala is the new champion, I think, of the JVM platform. Java is an object functional language, and James Goslin had this thing to say about it. If I were to pick a language to use today, other than Java, it would be Scala. And that is because Java, Scala is a, yeah, it's a, a beast with two heads. It's both an object-oriented programming language and allows you to use functional concepts. So Scala has a lot of important features, and it, as well as classes. You can write classes. It, uh, you have, instead of statics, you have companion objects. You can have uh, function objects. Uh, function objects uh, what is coming in Java 7. Well, almost, if I think about it. Um, function objects means that functions are a first-class citizen. So you can pass objects through uh, calling another, uh, but you can have a variable, which is a function, and you can pass that uh, lambda functions to other methods in a sort of delayed execution. So it's really useful for library writers. And then Scala also has uh, uh, some features from pattern languages. I should really ask how many people already know Scala or functional programming languages here? A fair number. So this is bread and butter to you folk. So yeah, pattern matching matching is a feature found in lots of functional languages like Erlang, Haskell, and ML, and Clojure, if anyone's done any Clojure on the JVM. Also Groovy. Groovy has a um, functional programming of a sort. And so as well as uh, Scala having that, it has proper mix-ins, and mix-ins are like interfaces on steroids, actually. So interfaces can have uh, methods, abstract methods, whereas in Java they cannot, uh, well, in Java 7, they w um, Java 8, rather, they will have default methods or defensive metho methods. Let me get my wording right here. And the other thing that Scala has is a great deal of thought has gone into the collection classes. So as well as your usual friends as in Java of lists, uh, maps, and, and what the other thing, um, Scala has its own collection, which is divided into two um, types, actually, immutable types. And Immutable types means that you can program it safely without destroying the, uh, the items in the collection. And also immutable, immutable types means that, that you get the same behavior as you have in, in Java collections. And there are proper, uh, um, in Scala, the immutable collection classes uh, are really that. So they, and are really, to, efficient in memory. So the list, list uh, collection is quite really good for um, in the functional sense that you can prepend um, when you prepend to a, an item to a list it be, operates in constant time which is really useful for certain algorithms. And the Scala allows you to write really good um, libraries. So So um, I wanted to say something about the ad adoption. And really, this is a talk about, I guess, a, 
a business talk rather than a technical one. There's some te technical parts to it. Uh, adoption for me has been a little bit patchy. Uh, uh, it's been increasing slowly. And I think because uh, we have, it's, as I would say myself, that people have been afraid to adopt Scala because it's been seen as being complicated. And, but you know, there are people who are willing to take the risk and it's those people who are willing to be earlier adopters to a language like Scala then have, um, want a faster return of investment. So they're willing to, uh, to go with that language because they don't have the, the, the employees, the massive number of employees or the legacy technology to, uh, to contend with. The, um, I think Scala also is, well, Scala is also a vi the only viable statically compiled programming language at the moment. Um, but that may change uh, over the coming years. Uh, and of course, if your business does really is invested on the Java virtual machine and the platform, you really probably don't want to be programming in Erlang or Haskell at the moment or, or leaving that, the platform. So it's a continuous inve investment. So in tr last year, at the beginning, beginning of last year, I had this um, little notion to create a chart of where I thought uh, the whole polyglot scene on programming under JVM was going. So I thought Scala would be, have that really nice sweet spot of being ready for adoption. And of course, the, we already know there's Groovy, there's a JRuby, and Phantom and others. And this is probably different, this graph is probably not accurate to the United States it's, uh, and, or to the UK. Uh, there's some Groovy adoption, uh, less uh, JRuby or Ruby adoption and uh, practically no Phantom. So yeah, depending on which locale you are living in, yeah, this is, this is it. Um, so the, what this graph says is it's emphasizing um, what the JVM has. It's portable, networkable, and has security. The three p pillars of the JVM platform that all got us excited in 1995, although it wasn't me, of course. I was still doing C and C++ at the time. So, um, and what I was trying to suggest there that it is a core of, of languages around that runtime. And we are all going to be developing increasingly in a polyglot f uh, fashion. And last year, I came up with a, a projection. All projections are, are meaningless because things could change. Microsoft could release their successor to Java and we'd be all doing something different. Um, so this chart is really de-emphasizing de those three pillars of Java because they're less important. Of course, we've got portability, we've got networkability in, in other platforms like JavaScript and Node.js and other things. And we've, security is less of a concern. Um, but this, the, the vectors of progress are about ever increase in performance on ever and on hardware we we have a cpu cpu and gpu cores our graphical processor units of 3000 cores and we have no way of actually using utilizing them and scala being a more flexible language allows you to write domain specific languages and martin odersky thinks or is researching how to get more from these cores, as other people are. So that is the joint research project between the, the ETFL and um, I guess it's Berkeley down the road from here. So this is how you declare a Scala function. 
and it for me it when I first looked at it it was more like Pascal so you have your name of your variable or field first and then you have the type and some people disagree with that a certain Stephen Colburn disagrees with that and I think it's right because Scala has type inference that means sometimes you can leave off the type of things so for example you can I can't walk can I all right the, the return type is of this volume price function is float and that doesn't that float doesn't need to be there Scala will probably infer that as actually being a double and, and but if you're a library writer and you're going to work with other people it's probably best to, to, to declare the right return type uh, the question was, as there, is there potential ambiguity as it, there is in Perl? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. And it, which means that you should be explicit and prefer to declare the return type. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, I will carry on. So Scala being object functional supports the notion of higher order functions. So. Again, this is bread and butter to the people who already know about higher order function and functional languages. And I didn't know this. I've been a, an OO baby since the early 90s. And uh, functional languages over my head. I don't want to know. But as I started to read more of the press, the industry press, and I and yeah, imagine that's why you're all here to understand and learn what's going to come down in, in one year from now. I had to say, well, maybe I don't really want to learn that Erlang or Haskell, but I've got time to play around. I like Java. I want to stay with the JVM platform. And then, okay, 2009, I, I actually bought the Scar intro into Scala book. And the thing is, it just sat there because I'm doing Java effects, I'm doing something else at work, I'm helping the investment banks make money. <laughs> so it wasn't until I did a course then uh, in London that, okay, it's starting to make sense. And when you learn f from a master, I'm, I'm digressing here, this is meant to be a Java EE integration talk. When you watch Martin Odersky actually code there, and, He's in Emacs and he's run, running his function. I can't keep up with him and it's all over the head for you, for those functional bread and butter guys who put their hands up. They'd probably be laughing. They could probably imagine that, uh, what happened there. But I, I'm getting there. And so, which I should explain some of this. So this is an example of a list collection, instantiating a list in, in Scala. And Scala is inferring the type of that XXS list, which is a list of string, parameterized type. And the zip with index function is a higher order function which iterates all over the elements of that list collections and maps it to a tuple appear appear if you come from the C++ world we, of only two values and a very simple data type and which is the string and also the index of that of where you are in the list collection so apple is associated with the index of zero plum is associated with the index of one orange is associated with the index of two which is what you get out in the uh, and in the comment line, lines there. So um, Scala is quite very much like uh, Java in supporting the, uh, the double slash comments. Okay, so um, that's enough of Scala. And, and then, yeah, the other bits you probably could work out by now. And, oh yes, so Yes, so the upper part I should really explain for the benefit of the recording that um, zipping two lists together obviously gives you um, the ability to have a concatenate list together and you can also have a, 
a list of, a, of collection of list collections, and there's an important function in uh, functional programming uh, supporting the idea of monads. Monads, anybody? Well, the flatten, flatten in a list is very important in that world. But you'll learn it if you choose to do it. So the, the thing about the JVM, which I actually absolutely love, is the choice. You can afford to then stick with Java, and that's cool. You can not decide, you can stay with it, uh, Java 7, and then Java 8 will be OK. And, you're part, and you can then probably find that you like dynamic languages, and, and you can work with Groovy or, or JRuby or something else, or even Clojure if you're inclined. So it, it's, it's a choice thing. Where it comes down to it is the business. The business dictates most of our lives and has done for several years. So, and this is perhaps our own fault. We gave the business a rod, a very thick rod to beat us with. And Spring, Spring Framework solved a very good problem in in years gone. So anybody here remember Java to, or J2EE? A few people. And did EJB, did you actually do EJB1 or EJB2? Two. Two, okay. Yeah. One. One and two. Well, you probably remember Entity Beans, which were, and I remember uh, a Swiss unnamed bank that they had an EJB project there, and that was my first um, encounter with that world. And uh, then along came, uh, came Spring Framework and dependency injection, and a bit of what's that? I mean, people sort of understood it, but didn't get it, and it took me a while. So dependency injection is the Basically, it's the Hollywood principle for the beginners in the audience, where uh, I am the Hollywood agent. I'm going to call you. You never call me at all, except to give me a lambda function. <laughs> and I'll call you. So um, dependency injectors frameworks look after the lifetime of the beans and uh, the closest um, relatives to spring, in, into spring framework are obviously juice and seam and contents, context and dependency injection frameworks um, of the past, such as Avalon, anybody who uses Avalon, who, or hard code Maven guys probably struggling with um, Maven, writing Maven plugins. But anyway, so I did go to Gress again. So there's, um, there's a bean container, there's lifecycle management. The Spring framework also has uh, Lots of APIs, wrapper APIs for JDBC, um, JPA. There's even a modern view controller framework. That it's really good. Uh, good for the time. It's a request orientated framework in comparison to uh, a component orientated framework, as that was the case for Tapestry. That's how Tapestry was, Apache Tapestry and Java Server Faces was were described at the time. And of course, if you're br very brave enough, you could do some aspect oriented program to uh, enable cross-cutting concerns. So I, I doubt if m uh, many of you have come across Spring Integration, and I certainly have. So Spring Integration is uh, an interesting byproduct of the Spring world, and it addresses um, enterprise integration, which is middleware. So order processing systems, transaction management, um, customer ordering, warehouse ordering, things like that, probably uh, how you get your Amazon invoices or whatever you do on e-commerce sites are probably through a message system. And it, it comes from Gregor Ho, uh, his very famous book, uh, to, which describes uh, basically, it's the, the Bible of EAI, Enterprise Application Integration, and it's all about channels, method channels, transformers. You can take a, 
a feed from somewhere, somewhere like PayPal, PayPal, put, send that to an XML style sheet transformer and get some different results. You can split messages into two um, and, and aggregate them all together. You can even resequence messages, and it's a really useful way of like building a message system. And it can go both directions as well. So I spent a, a, a good part of the couple of months uh, working on a propriety implementation that worked with the Spring Integration Framework. There's also Camel. Um, what's great about oh sorry about Spring, and I should say, is the XML, and it means that for business or uh, independent software vendor or consultancy, they can provide uh, their classes in a jar and then to the customer wire things up using XML. And it's still the preferred way, even though there are things like um, CDI and uh, contents in dependency injection. And, oh, and obviously, the Spring integration doesn't have, it's not standardized. This, there's no Java specification release for this, or at least I don't know there is. There's nothing ever been standardized in, in, and because perhaps the demand isn't there. Um, Spring integration, the competing ones are Service Mix, Apache Camel, I think that's an Apache project. They, they do similar things as well. And of course, um, Spring integration, uh, and the last time I looked earlier this year, they did announce Scala, a Scala DSL. Of course, Camel already has and supports DSL, uh, a Scala DSL, DSL, a domain specific language. So the, the interesting thing is modularization. Um, um, I think there are, there are businesses that have invested in OSGI. Uh, the de facto standard, even though there are others, possibly other, others, but it's the main guy in town. And the reason I think, well, the reason I believe that businesses like uh, this is because it affords some kind of protection for modules and reduces the risk um, so that, I guess, other developers, you hand over a, a product over the wall as a jar, and then the, that customer could be suddenly decide to, right, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm not going to pay you any money as a, as a consultant. I'm going to start programming against your thing. And, and they, they have every right to do so, I guess. <laughs> so, and it's also a protection inside the, the business, the, the, the vendor then knows that two different parts of the software development organization, and I, I call up NetBeans, they, they have different um, OSGI plugins, and if you try to access a, a, something in a module, an OSGI module, which is not declared as public, then it fails. So, there's a, so there are good reasons for static modularity. I'm not quite sure about dynamic modularity because everybody just restarts the server <laughs> at one point. <laughs> yes, and, and the modularity is obviously only enforced by the OSGI class loader. And there are things that haven't been ported over are not really OSGI conformance like commons login and the spring source had a big uh, porting ever effort to uh, have a Spring DM server, Spring OSGI server. They thought that had, that was a great push, but I, I'm not sure what the status of, this, of it right now. Having said that, OSGI is, is not a replacement for what's, in, in my opinion, for what's coming in Jigsaw, which is not going to happen now until 2015. So it's not, OSGI doesn't solve 
the JVM packaging problem of chucking away or breaking up the JDK, well, the Java runtime. And of course, ultimately, you want modularity to be sorted by the thing that's the pizza base, the JVM. And that will give you really good things so that you'd be able to have different versions of the Java platform. I'm just repeating what Mark Reinhold said in his talk. Uh, okay, so, but the thing is with Scala, like all the statically compiled languages, and this would apply, I guess, to Salon and Coit Kotlin, that they also could integrate because every, it runs on the Java platform, you could call any API that you like. Whether it makes sense to do so, I don't know. Because what some pe what people would do is they start program programming against this API in a in their favorite language, and it doesn't feel it feels you know unfamiliar. It feels uncomfortable. So I'm gonna. Pimp my, uh, pimp my API frame thing and put a, a Scala wrapper or a Salon wrapper to make it more Salon-like or Scala-like. So I'm being pretty open because the platform is open. And uh, that's my opinion. We're go all gonna have to learn to live together. And of course I have my favorite, which is Scala as well as Java, right? Okay. So, um, question probably for me. Um, the chief technical officer walks in in the morning and, oh, bad spelling. This Scala thing, what do you think? Well, I've already had this sort of conversation, but perhaps not with a CTO. I think Scala's going to make it. The adoption is going to be a lot slower. And uh, the question is, how do you integrate it with Java EE? Well, you can use it with Java EE, just like any um, API that's out there. So Java EE 7 is no longer refocused on moving to the cloud. In fact, it's been repositioned as HTML5, CSS, free, and WebSockets enablement, so it more Whereas Java EE5 was about ease of deployment, and this year's Java 1, it's more, yeah, a, a step back, and I, instead of trying to standardize in the way that we did uh, in, with EJB2, which was top down, and they got it so badly wrong, then hey, Rod Johnson, I can write this better. I'm going to have used this dependency injection. I'm going to have plain old objects. I'm, I, these guys don't know what they're doing. So I think, for me, the, Java, the repositioning of Java EE7 without the platform as a service requirement is a really good thing because, yeah, the providers don't quite know or where there's no consensus. And of course, that's what it means for you guys. That's what I would advise. I would say, yes, if you really want to move to the cloud, yes, you can do that. But, but there is no standard there yet. So be careful how you architect your solution with the knowledge that there are certain parts of it that could be vendor locked in that could be the same, uh, you know, and this is the case for anything. So if you, if you get in bed with Spring integration, you're stuck with it. You can't then move to Apache Camel, and you can't then, or unless without refactoring and then changing your code base, and if you get tired of that you, you, and you want to move to Apache Moo, it's the same. So whatever thing you invest in, you really need to sit down, have a word with the chief architects, and come to cons consensus there. And I guess that's what it means for the average Joe and Jane. But of course, that doesn't apply to you, because you're here at this lovely Java 1 conference, and you're learning things. Yeah, so yeah, no wonder they cut it down. 
Well, I guess I would rather J of Java EE, but that would be the ignorant thing to say. Um, there, there is a lot in a standard in Java Enterprise Edition, the full stack. There's lots of things to implement, and I, you probably cannot read this slide at all. It's, uh, well, there's uh, batch processing, there's going to be beam validation, there's uh, CDI, concurrency, dependency injection. Some of these things are um, probably not relevant anymore. Uh, it's, uh, there's things there that are going to be new, like JSON. JCatch has been revised, which may be a good way to standardize or avoid the lock-in maybe of, of a memcache if someone provides a, a, a Java interface to it. Um, yeah, and so on. And of course, there's old things like Java messaging system, uh, Java server faces. If I think, yeah, there are, I guess there are lots of people who use server faces in America. Not so much in, in the UK. I'm not, are people using server faces, Java server faces? Yeah, so there's a fair number of folk, and it's probably, I bet, are you using um, something like prime faces or ice faces? Yeah, so it's, um, yeah, see, it has its use. It's, and there's obviously uh, RESTful services, like JAXRS and JAXWS. And the most important thing is the CDI, um, which has came out in EE6. Uh, uh, I really do like that. Uh, so Spring versus Java EE7. So this came, comes up a lot. And really, it's a misunderstood question, really. Uh, Spring framework has its own container and has some for a number of years. Investment banks depend on it and use it. They have no problems. And they probably say, why should, why? Why do, well, will I want to get rid of Spring? And you could say, reason well, let's, uh, well, you're, it's vendor login. But, but then there's other things. If they suddenly decide to use Spring Data or Spring Integration, then, then it makes it more attractive to stay with the Spring sp platform. And the, the real question is, can I use these two things together in, in harmony? And that's going to be the consultancy or the contractor ours. If you really want to do it, it's your money, mate. You decide what you want to do. <laughs> Any questions? Any questions? I should. No? Yes? Okay. Uh, there's other things in Spring that uh, Spring DM I've already covered. And, yeah. and so Java EE7, for me, is the standard. It's uh, still the way forward for the vendors to cooperate together and as well. It gives you a target to aim for. And yeah, as you, somebody could say, hang on a minute, do we really need this Java EE stuff because it's so big? Well, the answer to that is more, perhaps more profiles. Um, I, you know, I thought, to answer the cloud question two years ago, I thought there would be a cloud edition which would be a separate thing altogether. This would be new API, APIs aimed at cloud platforms. So it, it sort of does not surprise me that, yeah, with, with innovation and experimentation and customer interest in Flex, it, it's, it doesn't make really good sense to standardize on, on a moving fee. So otherwise, we will repeat the same um, mistake that in uh, JTE 1.2 with EJBs and, uh, and the wrong, um, and not being using dependency injection or plain old Java beans. And of course, that, that, is, what, that is what CDI and uh, Java EE mandates these days. And then there's the other thing, it says, 
factors outside of even Spring and Java EE. I mean, if I'm a Scala shop, I mean, hey, I'm, I'm gonna, I've got a brand new idea, I'm gonna start a startup tomorrow. Uh, how do I, do I really need this um, Java EE? You yeah, might, but if you can live with, and, and you're happy to experiment, and, and you know things like, uh, you're happy to take the risk of to, to learn play, and oh, I spoke to a guy today, he says Akka is really good, then yeah, you can go for it. And yeah, as more industry stories come through to, and are, are successful, and you hear that Scala's been successful in Twitter, and at this conference, uh, there was CME Group, uh, which was about a trading engine and I thought that would be something in Java. Next slide, the guy showed, I forget his name, his name is Renny something, something. He showed, me, showed us a slide. Hey, my trade, my matching engine is implemented in Scala. And, that, and it talks to a MongoDB database. I said, wow, fantastic. So if there's a use case, whether it's a, a million dollar, a billion dollar company, or a small company, you can find it. You don't really have to go to the Java EE route. And I think for the rest of us who work with Spring Framework on a daily basis, and don't mind, it's, uh, it's a toss up. And perhaps with new projects, experimental projects, you could say, yeah, let's try this to see if it works. Uh, and it's, for me, feels a little bit more complicated than when Java Server Pages was first announced, and everybody wrote spaghetti pages, with put all the code inside the server page, and then Craig McClanagan invented struts. Ah, oh, that's the way to go. I put all my actions in Java, and then I remove all this present this logic from the presentation, and it goes into the form beans, and I have more actions. Feels like that. There's no kind of clear winner here. Well, I covered some of this. Uh, so Java EE seven. Uh, yeah, platform as a service is the new Wild West, and it's, it hasn't been tamed. People are not quite sure what to do there in order to standardize it, and I'm sure Oracle and Red Hat and Apache will come to some ideas. And there's obviously an elephant in the room here, which is Amazon Web Services, and they, why would they want to standardize? They may decide to change their mind, or. or and there's things, as I said, innovation and how we deploy. Um, how do you automatically decide, decide and say, oh, wow, well, my EJB really needs to be multi-tenant multi on some column, or maybe a customers who live in some on a continent and all begin with the letter S. I, I want to be able to scale from 10 to 100 servers. And these sort of things haven't been def defined yet, but they will be. And maybe going forward, they, as, uh, as it pans out, it may, I hope it won't be XML hell. <laughs> I hope it will be some way of com configuration in, and, uh, that, that we as developers can sanely live. So, so for, to give an example of that, so CDI, context and dependency injection is great. And you can use it on the server side. And so you can spin up uh, your application server and, and have something in, uh, be injected into one bean that depends on another bean. But there's no CDI container for J Java SE yet. And so there's Apache, uh, uh, what is it, um, e EJB, and there's obviously Weld, which comes from Red Hat. 
and you have to explicitly use one or the other. Then I think maybe there's a, an open source uh, API out there that conveniently wraps the two together. So I'm not going to go into platform as a service and SaaS and II information infrastructure as a service. Um, this is then uh, an attraction to the business then to the managers. Uh, so Java E is a question. Uh, the, the cloud providers, as I see, want to provide some, a modicum of support for people who have worked with Java EE. It's usually through JPA and with some limitations, obviously. Um, and so eventually, platform as a service will be standardized. And I had some things to say um, more about the management. Uh, if they decide, so if you have a manager who's uh, is in really invested in Java, it's, it's going to be really hard to tell him or her that you should chuck away this Java stuff right now. It's impossible. So, and you know, standards are good. Standards are great. Java EE is a great and will be a great standard. Uh, it's, it really does focus um, the vendors to collaborate, to build solutions, and, and really going, if you're moving to the cloud, I suppose in Java EE8, you really want standards to work because you're, if you're not unhappy with your cloud provider in 2016, you damn well sure want to be able to migrate to another cloud provider. Surely they might cost you cheaper electricity or something like that. So you want that portability, and I think that's going to be paramount. And I say, I don't know, but I, I hope that's where it is. Uh, what should we say to this line management guy, senior business trading systems at a said bank? I don't know. Um, still don't know. The answer is there. Uh, yeah, you probably can work with a private cloud, but because you are have really, you're going to come under regulation, you probably don't want to host your important wares in Amazon Web Services. You'd rather probably do something on your own, spend some money, um, and have uh, private data centers, which is they're not proper cloud, I guess, but uh, there you go. Um, and at this point, I'm going to finish the presentation. Uh, so I think the first thing that will be attacked will be uh, standardization on new SQL, no SQL providers. And so there'll be a few there that I think Oracle or Red Hat will talk to on MongoDB to try and, and ascertain how can we get, what's, what is the common denominator there? What are people actually doing? And as those industry stories, as you guys inevitably will start developing software out of maybe by coincidence, or maybe you have a great idea, and then the, the manager does work, walk in tomorrow and say, this is what we're going to do in 2013. He comes in Monday morning. That's it. Uh, so that it, it will resolve itself. And yeah, sure, people who want to do the bleeding edge on, on Scala or whatever language, or Coitlin or Ceylon or Groovy, are welcome to do it. But this is where I disagree with some of the rhetoric. I, I think Spring Framework is good. It solves a definite business need. Um, I, I think Spring Framework is here to stay. I'm sorry, because b there are going to be businesses that don't want to migrate. They, they are going to stay with the Spring container, and you could talk to them about CDI and all the benefits until you're blue in the face. But they pay the money, and if they're happy, that's fine. But at the same time, Java EE will improve, improve an addition upon addition. And so there's no worries really there. And thus, I conclude my presentation. And 
Hey, if, if you want to continue and with the discussion or perhaps with me, yourself, or with the ideas, because this is where it is all over to you. So thanks for coming. <laughs> So do you think that Spring Framework is good, or what, what's your opinion on Spring Framework? Proven. It's broken? Proven. Proven. Yeah, so, so the, I think Spring Framework is definitely proven. And yeah, so what would you improve in it? Can it? Can, since Rod Johnson has left, can it be innovated anymore? Is it? No? <laughs> no, I, I think, yes, it, it's going to go into other areas now, as in spring data. And, and obviously, spring integration will probably continue and on that front. Yeah, so if there's no more questions, um, feel free to come and uh, do you want did you have a question sir okay okay thank you thanks for attending <laughs>